In this video, we're going to cover conditional probability and um, the multiplication rule. So when we say conditional probability, it is the most important concept in probability. And uh, this is because uh, partial information uh, concerning the result of the experiment uh, often is available. And given that known information, uh, one certainly knows better whether an event can occur or not. And the uh, calculation of probability of certain event uh, sometimes can only be done through what we call conditioning. Okay, so meaning to say the occurrence of an event may be uh, dictated by uh, an occurrence of a previous event. All right? So um, the conditional probability of an event A, in this case, uh, given that another event B has already happened or has occurred, is given by the following formula. Okay, so we are going to expound on this uh, later on. So this is uh, given by our notation. So you see this uh, vertical line. This is read as the probability of event A occurring wherein B already ha happened. Or in this case, the probability of event A occurring given that event B already occurred. And that is given by the probability of the intersection of the two events and we divide it by the probability of the event that already occurred, okay? And we have to make sure that this event is not an impossible event, okay? Uh, so that its probability will not be equal to zero, okay? Now, um, the intuitive approach of uh, conditional probability, okay, or uh, by common sense, okay, what do we mean by the conditional probability? So let's uh, take this, for example. The conditional probability of B given A, so in this scenario, A already happened or A already occurred. So what are the chances that B is going to occur wherein A already occurred? Okay, can be found by assuming that A already happened or occurred or has occurred and working on the assumptions or working on that assumption that A already happened, we may be able to calculate the probability that event B is going to occur. Okay, so given that A already happened, with whatever result or whatever is the outcome of event A occurring, what will be the chances that B is going to occur? Okay, so that is the intuitive approach to conditional probability. Okay, let's take this up for example. Say 100 college students were surveyed and asked how many hours a week they spent studying. So the results are in the table below. So we're going to find the probability that a student spends more than 10 hours studying given that the student is a male. Okay. So these are the two events that um, are involved in this problem. The event that the student studies uh, more than 10 hours okay, and the event that the student is a male. So with this uh, requirement in the problem, that is, uh, we are going to look for the probability that a student spends more than 10 hours studying given that the student is a male. That means to say, the event that already occurred or must have happened or our condition is that the student is a male. Okay, and working on that assumption of the male students, how many are studying more than 10 hours? Okay, so by the intuitive approach uh, to conditional probability, the new sample space now will be the 49 male students. So of the 49 male students, how many are studying more than 10 hours? So um, shifting our attention to this column, um, the number of students that are studying more than 10 hours that are male would be 16. Okay, so that's why the probability that the student is studying more than 10 hours given that that student is a male would be 16 out of the 49 male students. So therefore, we will end up with 0 0.3265. Okay, that is uh, by intuitive approach. Now, let's say, for example, we will make use of the formula. Okay, and our formula indicates that the probability that the student uh, studies more than 10 hours given that the student is a male, okay, is that we're going to get the intersection of the two. So in this case, the probability of the intersection of the student studying more than 10 hours and being a male, okay, and we divide it by the probability that the student is a male. Okay, so from our table, the probability that uh, of the intersection of 
um, the student studying more than 10 hours, which is this column, okay, and uh, the student being a male is this row, okay, and the intersection is, in this case, is 16. So there are 16 of them out of the total, which is 100. So the probability is 16 over 100. What about the probability that the student is a male? So the probability that the student is a male, there are 49 of them out of the 100. So therefore, we have 49 over 100. So simplifying this, we will cancel the 100, and we will end up with 16 over 49, which is exactly what we've had here earlier. Okay, And that will be equivalent to 0 0.3265. Okay, so I will need you to verify on these values if we will end up with the correct um, estimate, which is 0 0.3265. Okay, so I hope the concept of conditional probability is clear here. Okay, now, um, we have what we call the multiplication law or, or multiplication rule or what we call the law of multiplication. Okay, so for any two events A and B, right, so we are now looking for the probability that event A and B is going to occur. Okay, so take note of our notation for and that will be indicated by the intersection of the two events. Again, going back to the definition of intersection, we say A intersection with B would indicate that we are looking for the outcome or the elements belonging in both A and B. Okay, so therefore, if in the problem you are asked of the probability of A and B, then that would mean to say we are looking for the probability of their intersection, okay? And the pro by our multiplication rule, the probability of A intersection B is equal to the probability of A given B already occurred, and we multiply it with the probability of B. In the same manner, if uh, A already happened, so we will get the probability of event A occurring, and we multiply it with the probability of event B, Occurring, okay, we're in A already happened. All right, um, we will um, illustrate this with an example for us to better understand this multiplication rule. Okay, let's take this one. So, say at a fair, a vendor has 25 helium balloons on strings. Okay, so of the 25, 10 are yellow, 8 are red, and 7 are green. So, that will sum up to 25. That's 10 plus 8 plus 7. So balloons are sold in random order. And we're looking for the probability that the first two balloons sold are both yellow. So meaning the first balloon sold is yellow and the second balloon is also yellow. Okay, so let's define our events in this case so that we will be guided properly. So let's take event A or the event that the first balloon sold is yellow. And let us consider event B is the event that the second balloon sold is yellow. Since we're looking for the probability that the first two balloons sold are both yellow, so that will indicate the intersection of the two events, therefore we will have the probability of A intersection with B, meaning to say the probability that the first balloon is yellow and the second balloon sold is also yellow. Right? Now, for us to better understand this notation, Okay, I just interchanged the two so that we will uh, better understand this. Anyway, we are dealing with multiplication and multiplication is commutative. So meaning, since the first balloon sold is yellow, we are looking for the probability that the first balloon sold is yellow. Okay, we multiply that outcome with the probability that the second balloon sold is yellow wherein the first one sold was a yellow one. Okay, so this is what we mean by this notation. All right, so let's analyze the problem. So what would be the probability that the first balloon sold is yellow? How many yellow balloons are uh, there all in all? That would be 10, okay? So what is the chances or what will be the probability or what are the chances that the first balloon is yellow? Okay, or the first balloon sold is yellow. So that will be 10 out of the 25, okay? So we will have a 10 uh, over a 25, okay? Now, the question is, how did we get 9 over 24? Now, remember, you already sold the first balloon to be yellow, and the probability of selling the first balloon to be yellow is 10 over 25. Now, since one balloon had been sold of the 25, how many are remaining? So that would be 24, okay? However, 
of the 10 balloons, the first one sold was yellow. So therefore, of the 10 balloons that are yellow, ang remaining would only be 9. Therefore, the probability that the second balloon to be sold is yellow, wherein the first one sold was already yellow, is 9 out of the 10 balloons. Okay, so only 9 of them are available now. Out of the 24 balloons left when the first one sold was yellow. Okay, so I hope you understand uh, this notation better by this example. So in this case here, multiplying this, we will end up with 10 times 9 over 25 times 24 will be simplified to 3 over 20. And that will be equivalent to 0 0.15. So I will need you to verify if uh, that value is, um, if we come up with the correct uh, values here. Okay. All right. So I think um, the common um, confusion would arise by having to make use of the notation that we have. But it is better to always go back to the problem and understand what the problem is about. Because in most cases, uh, um, probability problems would uh, simply be by common sense. Okay. So yeah. Let's continue. We are going to extend that law. What about if there are more than two events involved or even four events involved? Okay, so what do we mean by this? So the extended law of multiplication is that for any three events, let's say A, B, and C, okay? So we're interested that all three events are going to happen. That is probability of A and B and C. Okay, so what would be the chances that all three events are going to occur? So by this notation, what we mean by this? So in that case, A already occurred. So we will get the probability of A. We multiply it with the chances or with the probability that B is going to happen wherein A already occurred, meaning whatever is the outcome in A will have an impact on B. All right? And we're looking for the probability or we're going to multiply the probability of the third event occurring wherein A and B already occurred. So that is what we mean by this notation. Okay, in the same manner, if we're going to extend that to four events, let's say A, B, C, and D, so we're looking for the probability of A and B and C and D occurring, all right? What do we mean by this notation? Okay, so we will have, we will take the probability of the first event. Whatever is the outcome in A or in the probability of event A occurring, we multiply it with the probability that the second event is going to happen, okay? We're in A already occurred. We multiply it with the probability that the third event is going to happen wherein A and B already happen. And multiply it to the probability of the fourth event occurring wherein A and B and C already happened. Okay, so we will have an example for this um, in a while. Alright, so um, we, we can actually extend this to more than four events. Okay, but um, here are some two more uh, important concepts that we have to keep in mind. So say sampling with replacement. This occurs when an object is selected and then we put it back before the next object is selected. Okay, so remember when something was drawn, for example, or chosen, before you make the second pick, all right, or before you make the second draw, all right, you put back what was picked in the first draw. Okay, so that means to say, the total number of elements uh, would remain the same all throughout the experiment because it's sampling with replacement. Okay, now, what about when we say sampling without replacement? So when you say sampling without replacement, it occurs when an object is selected and not replaced before the next object is selected. Okay, so mean to say, if let's say in the first draw, I pick out an object, okay, before I make the second pick, whatever was picked in the first draw will not be put back. So meaning, every time you make the next pick, the total number of objects, okay, is actually changing. Or in that case, it is decreasing, okay, depending on what was drawn in the first pick. So that is what we mean by sampling without replacement, okay? Now, Let's um, have an example for us to better visualize the extended law of multiplication. Okay, so let's take this. Say four cards are drawn at random without replacement from a deck of 52 cards. 
Okay, so again, we have a deck of 52 cards. We have um, cards that are eights, uh, numbers 2 to 10. Then we have jack, queen, and king. And for each type of card, cards, we have four different suits. That would be um, a spade, clubs, then we also have hearts and diamonds. Okay, so here we're looking for the probability of getting an ace on the first draw, a king on the second, an ace again on the third draw, and a queen on the last draw. Take note, this is without replacement. So whatever had been picked in the first draw will not be put back before you make the second draw. In the same manner, whatever were picked in the first two draws will not be put back before you make the third draw. And in the same way, uh, all three um, that were picked in the first three draws will not be put back before you make the fourth draw. Okay, so let's define our events involved in this problem. Event A is the event of getting an ace on the first draw. Event B will be getting a king on the second draw. Event C is getting an ace on the third draw. And event D is getting a queen on the fourth draw. So to this, uh, our desired probability in this case is that we are looking for the probability that we get an ace on the first draw and, so that's why we use the intersection notation, um, getting a king on the second draw and an ace on the third draw and a queen on the fourth draw. Okay, so by our law of multiplication or the extended law of uh, multiplication, we will be looking for the probability of event A. That is the event of getting an ace on the first draw. So how many aces are there in the deck? That would be 4 out of 52. Okay, now remember, this is without replacement. So whatever was drawn will not be put back. So of the 52 cards, since an ace was drawn, one card was drawn, okay, out of the four aces, how many are left? That would be 51 are remaining in the deck. So of the 51, we will get the probability of getting a king. So how many kings are there in the 51 cards remaining? That would be 4 out of 51. Okay, so two cards were drawn that will uh, that were not replaced. So meaning to say of the 52 cards, two cards were drawn, ang remaining would be 50. But take note, in the third event, we are getting or we are looking for the probability of getting an ace. But remember, in the first draw, we already took one ace card. So of the four aces in the deck, okay, we took one already. How many are remaining? That would be three. Okay, and of the 52 cards in the deck, we're in two, we're already picked, 50 are remaining. So that would mean to say the probability of getting an ace on the third draw would be 3 over 50. Right now, all three cards were picked and were not replaced before the fourth draw. Okay, so that means to say of the 52 cards, three were picked. and remaining would be 49. So of the 49 cards remaining, what will be the probability of getting a queen? And how many are queen? cards in our deck that would be 4 out of the 49 remaining cards. So simplifying this, we multiply all of them. We will end up with 8 over uh, 270725 or 270,725 which will be equivalent or approximately equal to 0 0.000030. So I rounded off up until the first non-zero digit. So I will need you to verify if the values that we have here are correct. Okay? Now, Let's proceed to what we refer to as independent events. Okay, so the two events are said to be independent if the occurrence of one of the events does not affect the probability of the other event. Okay, so that means to say, if the first event already happened, whatever is the outcome of the first event will have no influence or will have no impact on the succeeding events, then we say the events are said to be independent. Alright, so two events, A and B, are independent if, the if, let's say event A already happened, but event A, whatever is the outcome in A, will not dictate the outcome in B. Therefore, if we're looking for the probability of event B wherein A already happened, will simply be the probability of event B. In the same manner, if we have this notation, this will indicate that B already happened. 
So we're looking for the probability of A wherein B already happened. But B, but the probability or the outcome in B will have no influence on this event A. Therefore, the probability of A wherein B already happened will simply be equal to the probability of event A. Okay? So events that are not independent will be referred to as dependent events. Let's take this for example. So let's decide if the events are independent or not. So selecting a diamond from a deck of cards. Okay, let's take that as our event A. And we put it back in the deck. So meaning to say this is with replacement. Okay? So if I pick one card, I put it back, the total number of cards will not be reduced. It will remain the same all throughout the experiment. Then we select a spade from the deck of cards. That is our event B. Okay, so selecting a diamond from a deck of cards, we put it back and then select a spade from the deck of cards, which is our event B. So the occurrence of A will not affect the probability or the outcome of the second event. Okay, that's because we put it back. It's with replacement. So it will not have any influence on our next event. So the events in this case are said to be independent. Because the number of spades, a uh, number of spade cards in the deck will not be uh, affected uh, by having to choose a diamond in the first event in the same manner because it's going to be put back in the deck. So the total number of cards remain the same all throughout. Okay? Now, let's take this. So the probability that two events, A and B, will occur in sequence, okay, that is probability of A and B, uh, we're looking for their intersection, uh, is given by wherein A already happened, okay? So here, we will get the probability of event A. We multiply it with the probability of the second event wherein the first event already occurred or already happened, right? And um, in this case, if event A and B are independent, meaning to say whatever is the outcome in the first event will have no influence on the outcome of the second event, then the rule can be simplified to simply... Okay, if we're looking for the probability of A and B occurring or both events to occur, that is, take the probability of event A, multiply it with the probability of event B. Okay, because B is not affected by A, then you simply have to get the probability of event B. Right, let's take this for example. Two cards are selected without replacement from a deck, so we will find the probability of selecting a diamond and then selecting a spade. From what we have indicated earlier, okay, the two are said to be independent from each other. Or in this case, oh, sorry, this one is different because this is without replacement, right? So in this case here, whatever was picked in the first draw will not be put back. So it will affect or influence the outcome of the second event, which was different from what we have presented earlier. It's because earlier it is without replace, uh, it was with replacement. Okay, and we find the probability of selecting a diamond and then selecting a spade. So here, the probability of selecting a diamond and spade, okay, we will get first the probability of selecting a diamond. And in that case, it is 13 over 52. There are 13 diamond cards, one of each type. Since it will not be replaced, the total number of remaining cards will be 51. Of the 51, how many are spades? So that would be 13. So that is 13 over 51. Simplifying that, we will end up with 13 over 204, or that will be equal to 0, uh, 0.0637. Okay, let's take another example. Say a die is rolled and two coins are tossed. So find the probability of rolling a 5 and flipping two tails. So let's analyze the events involved. So the probability of rolling a 5 when a die is rolled would be, in that case, whether or not we come up with a 5 in the uh, rolling of the die, all right, the outcome of our next event wherein um, a coin will be tossed or two coins will be tossed, okay, and getting a tail will not be affected by whatever is the outcome here. So therefore, the events are said to be independent. So therefore, the probability of getting a 5 when a die is rolled and getting tails, okay, and tails, in the two coins that were tossed, so we simply have to multiply each of the outcomes. And in this case, the probability of getting a 5 when you roll a die is 1 over 6. And the probability of getting a tail when a coin is tossed is 1 half. Thus, we simply have to multiply them. We will end up with 1 6 times 1 half times 1 half. And that will be equal to 1 over 24. And that is 
uh, approximately equal to 0 0.0417.